Let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of the Revelation. The book of the Revelation, chapter 19, will be there in just a moment as we continue tonight to answer your questions from the Bible. Uh, there is still time to ask questions, and every week it seems like another question or two trickles in. That's good. I don't care how long we take this. Um, I enjoy the study. I think it is beneficial to you, uh, especially if you ask the question. And I think other people have similar questions as well. By the way, if you were one of the first ones who turned in a question and you think that it hasn't been answered yet, uh, please feel free to ask when we're going to get to it. There is a possibility that we have, and it was a service that you missed. And so we'll be able to tell you that it's online, and this is the date that we dealt with it, and you'll be able to listen to it there. Uh, there's a possibility that I'm saving it. There is a question that's been asked that I'm going to save till probably middle of, no of December uh, before we answer that. We've got enough questions to get us through November and I think to get us into December, so it'll be good timing for that question. Uh, or it may be one that's going to take some work on my part, and I'm still digging for an answer. So if you wonder, where's my question at in the queue? Just ask, and I'll be sure to help you out on that and let you know. Last week, we had a lengthy explanation to a question that actually answered another couple of questions. And so just a quick review, because tonight's question is a tag on to that. The question that was asked was, where did Abel go when he died? We dealt with the salvation of Old Testament saints. Old Testament saints were saved just like we are. They were saved by grace through faith. They were not saved by the sacrifices. They were not saved by keeping the law. They were not saved by doing the best that they could or anything like that. They were saved by grace through faith. We drew the answer to the Abel question. You remember, if you got your little drawing, we drew a big circle and and uh, the big circle, uh, Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades in the New Testament, refers to this singular place where the Bible said all that the deceased went. There was a great gulf in between two sides. The one side would have words like hell, Gehenna, Tartar, Tartarus. Um, I think there was one other word that we would put on that side. The other side, we had the words heaven-ish, because it wasn't heaven, but heaven-ish, uh, we had the words uh, Abraham's bosom, we had paradise there. When Jesus Christ, at his, uh, at his death, he goes down to the positive, the good side of Sheol slash Hades, he takes captive those that were there with his ascension, takes them up and into the third heaven, into the heaven as we know it today. First, or I think it's 2 Corinthians that we looked at last week where Paul had that vision and he saw this individual that had been taken up into the third heaven up into paradise. There is no going down anymore. It is all going up. When we leave this world, Christian, we are absent from the body in the presence of the Lord. If you're here tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going down. You are going down to that place called hell or called Sheol or Hades. There is not the positive side there anymore. It's all the negative side, and that's where the lost would go. Now, there is this follow-up question attached to this. This is question 10, 10th of all the questions we've asked. Are the unsaved going to stay in hell for eternity or in the lake of fire? Yeah, that'll get you scratching your head for just a moment. It's not a hard question, but it's going to take up most of the night. So we're going to build this like we've been building it. There are only five references in the Bible to the lake of fire. All five of those references are in the book of the Revelation. So let's look at them tonight. Revelation chapter 19, look at verse 20. Revelation 19 and verse 20, the Bible says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Go over to chapter 20, starting in verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The description of hell, the bad side of Sheol or Hades, was an awful place of fire, torment, all the things that you can possibly imagine. And when you think of the word hell, that you would attach to that word. All the descriptors are there. The only way that I can put it is this. If hell is bad, the lake of fire would be worse. And as we'll see here in just a moment, the answer, and I, I, I'm not going to give you the answer. We'll get to it. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's take a look. Let's build this. First of all, let's consider the first inhabitants of the lake of fire. The lake of fire is currently empty. But take a look here in back to chapter 19 and verse 20. The first inhabitants, the Bible tells us, is the beast that was taken and with him the false prophet. So the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will be the first inhabitants of this place according to Revelation 19 and verse 20. There are always people who speculate, and speculation gets you into a lot of trouble, right? And the question is asked, where is the lake of fire? Now, if we were to answer the question, where is Sheol and Hades? The Bible tells us, as Jonah was three days and three nights, where? Middle of the earth. He's in the middle of the, in the what I just said. In the whale, yes, but the Bible says and the, the Lord is going to be in the belly of the earth. Jonah's in the belly of the whale. Jesus was going to be in the belly of the earth. So we know where Sheol, Hades is placed. Where's the lake of fire? The Bible doesn't tell us that. When I say speculation, it'll get you into trouble. Some guy says, and I read the article, and I'm just throwing this out. That way, if you ever reach that, you can say, oh, I've heard that before. I heard that's crazy. It is crazy. Said that it's the Dead Sea. And it was a lengthy article given all this information that's in the Dead Sea. And I read the article, and it didn't make a lick of sense. This person just rambled stuff out and put, it was like just grab, 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 and plop, put it on the paper. It made no sense. The scripture gives us no indication of where uh, the lake of fire is going to be. Take your Bible, though, and go back to Revelation chapter 14. There might be a little bit of an understanding we can get from this. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There's a ministry called Verse by Verse Ministry, and they write this. They said, notice the location of the place of eternal torment is said to be in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The description would imply that the lake of fire will be located in the heavenly places, not in the physical realm. Therefore, its existence is not impacted by the destruction of the first heavens and earth following the 1,000-year kingdom since it's not part of the created universe. Beyond this, they said, we cannot say where the lake of fire exists. So, that's one, if you was wondering where it's at, you're going to have to wait. Have to wait and find that one out and let the Lord tell us when the time comes. So the first inhabitants, the beast, the Antichrist. The second thing is this, it's eternal. It is eternal. Uh, Revelation 19 talks about the confinement of the beast and the false prophet. Look at Revelation chapter 20, the first two verses. The Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. 
And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The Bible tells us that Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. What will we be doing while Satan is bound? Millennial kingdom. So there's great things in store for us. We come back with the Lord in glorified bodies. We reign here on this earth with Him for a thousand years. Satan is bound for a thousand years. When Satan experiences his final defeat after the thousand years have expired, verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Chapter 20 and verse 10 says then, look at the verse, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet, what? doesn't say where they were, where they are. And you say, well, what's your point? How many times have you run into people and they do not believe that if they believe in hell, they don't believe that hell is eternal. They believe that hell is annihilation. They say, oh, a good, loving God would never send somebody to an eternity in that kind of torturous torment and all that. That's, that's not possible. If anything, a person is going to go to hell, poof, they're, they're burnt up, they're gone. It's not what the Scripture says. The Bible teaches for you and I as believers in Christ the eternity of heaven. Do you believe heaven is eternal? Well, if you believe heaven is eternal, how do you know heaven is eternal? We've not been there, so how do you know it's eternal? The Bible says so. Doesn't the Bible tell us also that hell's eternal? You can't believe in one place without the other because it's the same book that tells you about them both. And the same book tells us that both are eternal. So here we have the eternality of hell, or actually technically the eternality of the lake of fire. Here's the third thing, the timing of the events. Let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 5. John chapter 5. Let's look at the timing of this. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 25. The Bible says in verse 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Will everybody be resurrected someday? Everybody? Everybody. Why will all be resurrected? Because Jesus Christ is resurrected. And He is the first fruits of all who will be resurrected. Not just the believer, but of all of humanity, of all those created in the image of God. So someday the Bible tells us that there will be the resurrection of the bodies of the lost. At death the soul goes to eternity. The body is left in the grave, or the body is cremated and left in a jar, or a person has been burned up in a fire, or they have been blown apart in an explosion somewhere, or they were buried at sea and they are now shark food, or some other scenario. You say, how in the world is the Lord going to be able to put all those parts back together? Seriously? How did He create man? How did He create the woman? I don't think the Lord's going to have any problem, do you? So a body that has been dead for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the remains of, I mean, they're dust. Erosion has taken place. Who knows where that person got washed out to? God's not going to have any problem putting it all back together again. The first resurrection that the book of the Revelation talks about is all about the believer receiving their new body. What's our new body going to look like? We like to speculate that, don't we? Short people think, oh, I'm going to be tall. Bald people say, I'm going to have hair. Fat people say, we're going to be skinny. You know, we go through all these different scenarios. What are we going to look like? Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 
1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, it kind of tells us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Stop right there. If it doth not appear what we shall be, stop wondering. Stop speculating. Stop imagining. It doesn't matter. Because we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That day is coming. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we will be raised incorruptible. We will be raised immortal. We will be raised perfectly. Wherever the remains might have been. You say, well, what about that lost person? What happens to them? The Bible, doesn't, the Bible tells us very little about us, even less about them. What we can know is that when the lost person is resurrected, they will be raised immortal because they have to go through eternity in hell. We know that. We know that they will be recognizable based on Luke chapter 16. So the, I think we will be recognizable. I don't know if the Lord will tweak any of our features or anything like that. By the way, I can't back this up. So if you don't agree with it, I don't care. It's not going to break my heart. But if we were fearfully and wonderfully made by God, did God not create us to look like we do? So why do we think He would go in, in eternity and go, yeah, I really messed that up. Let's fix that. Let's fix that nose. Let's fix those eyes. Let's fix that ear. It just does, it looked, you know, wonky. I, I... Why do we think God would change our appearance? if we were fearfully and wonderfully made. So here's the lost people in hell. They're going to be recognizable. Let's go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Again, like I said, very little is told, so we just don't know. Daniel, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. In Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's very nonspecific, but yet isn't it beautiful? And wouldn't we kind of think that the opposite would be true of the lost person, uh, that the body of the unbeliever is just the opposite of this description. Again, not specific description, but a horrific description in contrast to the beautiful description of what the Lord is going to do for the believer in Christ. Let's go back to the book of the Revelation, chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, and let's talk about the criteria for entrance of all the deceased to the lake of fire. The criteria for entrance of all the deceased to the lake of fire. It says in Revelation 20 verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What is the criteria? Christians, you and I, someday, we will stand at the Bema seat. We will be at the judgment seat of Christ. It has nothing to do with our salvation. That has already been covered in the blood of Christ. That has been judged. Our sin has been judged. Everything's been taken care of in Jesus Christ. So when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, it isn't for the Lord to put our works in a basket and say, well, is it going to weigh out for him? How's it all going to work? No, we're saved. What it is is to try the works to see whether or not they were for the Lord or for some other motive. That which is for the Lord, it lasts and is rewarded. And those rewards, I believe that someday we're going to take those and cast them at the feet of Jesus. 
Here's the lost people. What they're standing at is the great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment, in a sense, it has nothing to do with their salvation either because they're already lost. And the Lord has the book of life, and He has the books that record their works. And you say, well, what's the book of life doing there? Don't you suppose that the Lord is going to open up that book and show them? Your name is not here. Your name is not here. So now we turn to these books. And the Bible says that they will be cast into the lake of fire forever. We cannot even wrap our minds around. We can't wrap our minds around what it's going to be like to go to heaven. But we cannot wrap our minds around the horror of the great white throne judgment. Every lost person will be there someday. There's no escaping it. And the Bible says that those individuals that are there, the descriptions that we saw last week of Sheol slash Hades and the hell side, the uh, Tartarus side, the uh, Gehenna side, all of that gets thrown into the lake of fire. So it's like we're going from bad to worse for all of eternity. The criteria for entering into heaven or into hell is always based upon what you've done with Jesus, this side of eternity. Every person that is in heaven has one thing in common. And it's not that they were the best person ever that walked the planet. It's not that they were a great individual, that they were just so nice once they got saved. You've met some Christians that aren't real nice, haven't you? And I mean, they just haven't been real pleasant to be around. And you've met some lost people that are just a, a joy to be around. You enjoy their company. You're not in heaven or hell in that criteria. You're, you're in heaven or hell based on whether or not your name's in the Lamb's book of life. The only way your name's in the Lamb's book of life is if you've trusted Jesus as Savior. That's the register that'll be checked. Nobody gets into heaven whose name isn't there. Nobody gets into heaven some way around Jesus Christ. Nobody. As you consider this lake of fire, look in Revelation 21 and verse 8. The fifth question, or the fifth part of this answer, really, we want to look at the source of the fire. The fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The brimstone is a sulfur fire. I'd like to read to you, uh, this is from the Warland, Wyoming Volunteer Fire Department. And this is what firefighters write about a sulfur fire. At first, it looks like a pool of wind-blown water with some occasional flames lapping at the surface. Then you realize that you're, what you're looking at is all flame. There's a burning sulfur mound. If you've ever been to a large landfill or even driven past one, then you're familiar with the smell of sulfur. It's rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide. Sulfur is also flammable and difficult to extinguish. In fact, a few books of the Bible use it to describe hell. I thought, that's pretty neat that a fire department's recognizing that. You may be familiar, they said, with fire and brimstone. Brimstone being burning sulfur. Not only are you subject to eternal damnation and inextinguishable flames, but it also has the stench of the rotten eggs. The smoke produced by this fire is dangerous. When sulfur burns, it produces sulfur dioxide, which turns into sulfurous acid when it comes in contact with water. That means that it can be deadly if you breathe it into your very moist lungs. They had a picture of a sulfur fire at the Texas Gulf Sulfur Plant in Worland, Wyoming. And I was going I, I to put it up so you could see it, but for a minute video, I didn't want to go through all that, but look it up sometime. You can go online and look it up. It was the most eerie, eerie thing to see. Where the sulfur was at that was on fire, it did look, you know, when the Bible talks about a lake of fire, it looked like water moving. And it's all fire. And then all of a sudden, out of the midst of that were, were these columns of fire. 
just shooting up to the sky. And you just never knew where those columns were going to be at. And then there were places of absolute darkness in the midst of that fire. And then all of a sudden, the pool of flames would just roll right over those areas of darkness, and the darkness shifted. And the guy that was videoing it, the firefighter, he had on his, his uh, apparatus, his air apparatus, and you could hear it as, it as he's videoing it. And then every once in a while, the little alarm would beep, and you'd have to shake it and wake it up and everything, let it know you're okay. And he just kept videoing this thing. And as you looked at that, and it wasn't that huge of an area. I mean, it was, it was big. Looked maybe like the area of the whole church, if you was to look at it from the sky, something about that big. But it was horrific. And you imagine a place that could contain millions of people from the centuries. And this bottomless lake of fire where those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior will suffer forever with no escape, with no reprieve, with no opportunity after time served to get bumped up. They're there forever. As I saw that, if that doesn't make you want to tell people about Jesus, I don't think anything would. Because that's where every lost person is headed. Your your lost family member, a lost spouse, a lost neighbor, a lost co-worker, that's exactly where they're headed. And they could be headed there a lot faster than they think. Take your Bible, if you will, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. The final question under this main question is this, will the unsaved stay in hell or eternity for eternity or in the lake of fire? And obviously it's going to be the lake of fire. My question is, why? Why transfer hell into the lake of fire? Perhaps here's an answer. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Perhaps this lake of fire is there because of the renovation that is coming to this earth and the heavens in preparation for the new heavens and the new earth. And there has to be the transfer of this hell to someplace else because the earth is going to be renovated. When we come back into this renovated earth, wow, what a place it's going to be. What an amazing new creation that God's given us to live on for eternity. Remarkable. Tonight, the obvious application of this is found in the fact that we If we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, this is something we will never experience. Never going to experience it. Not even a little bit. Catholicism teaches a purgatory. They teach a limbo. Those are unbiblical teachings. There is no such a place as either one. And it's straight out of Catholicism's doctrine. It is a created doctrine. The Bible teaches an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. And where you spend that eternity at all depends on Jesus. And if we know Christ as Savior, we need to be telling others about Christ. And here's something, sometimes you'll hear a comparison like this. People will say, well, as a Christian, we have got our hell on earth, and then we've got heaven for eternity. And to the lost person, you may have your heaven on earth, 
but you're going to have hell for eternity. Christians, if you ever say that, wash your mouth out with soap. This is not hell. Not even close. And it sure ain't heaven. So this isn't heaven for the lost and it's not hell for the saved. This is earth. Welcome to our world. Heaven and hell is an eternal thing. And the wonders and the glory of heaven is as undescribable as the horrors are of hell. And tonight, do you know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, where you're going to spend your eternity? If you say tonight, well, I don't think anybody can be sure. <laughs> what hope, first of all, what hope would there be in that? To go your entire life and go, well, I sure hope I'm going to make it. I hope I'm going to make it. I'm just holding out, hoping for the best. That's going to be a horrible, horrible way to live. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, the Bible says, By this we know that we have eternal life. Knowing it. We, and if we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life, now there's hope in that. And it's not a hope, well, like we hope tomorrow's going to be a nice day, or hope the sun's going to shine, or hope it's not too cold. It is a hope that has assurance, and it's confidence because it is based in the promises of the Word of God that the Lord gave us to cling to. We have the hope of knowing that heaven is in our future and that we are saved if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you don't have that hope. Your hope actually, technically, I guess, would go the other direction. And your hope's in eternity and hell. And it is with the same assurance and confidence that we can say that without Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is where you're going. But, but, there's good news, lost person. And that good news is Jesus Christ, who is not willing that any should perish. Put your name there. He's not willing that you would perish. He is not willing that you would go to hell. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins. He took the pain, the punishment, the humiliation. He took it all. He took your sins upon Himself. His blood is what was necessary for your sins to be atoned for before Almighty God. It was the blood of His own Son that had to be offered up to the Father. For you, for me. And you can sit here tonight and say, well, I've got my way. Everybody's got their own religion. Well, I agree. But there's only one relationship that'll get you to heaven. Religion will take you to hell. Do you realize the Baptist religion will take you to hell? What? Yeah. What is the Baptist religion? You can just go to our, our doctrinal statement. And you say, well, yeah, yeah, I you know, check my list and everything else. And you follow it religiously. Religion will take you to hell, even the right religion, even the right beliefs. The demons believe, they tremble. Nobody wants you to be religious. They want you to be right with God. And that's the only, the way, only way possible is through Jesus. Lost soul tonight, would you trust Him as Savior? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight. Lost person, how can we say it any more plainly? That God loves you. And that God wants to save your soul. And what He has in store for you for all of eternity is beyond your imagination. And what He has for you now in this life this is beyond imagination. Tonight, lost soul, do you believe that you're a sinner that needs to be saved? If so, tonight you can call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. Can you pray something like this? But it's got to be not my words. Please do not think that. This has got to be an expression from your heart to God because God is looking at your heart. Do you mean this? Can you honestly pray tonight and say, Dear God, I am a sinner, and I know it, and I deserve hell. Can you honestly pray that? 
Can you honestly pray tonight, God? I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve to be loved by you. Can you pray honestly tonight, God? I do believe that Jesus loves me. That he died on the cross for my sins. That he was buried in the tomb and that he arose again from the grave. And Lord, tonight I believe that is the gospel message that saves. And so tonight I call upon Jesus, confessing this is what I believe tonight. And I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me. To forgive me of my sin to make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life. I've been Lord for however many years you've been alive. And Lord, I've made a mess of it. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to take total control. Here's my life, Lord. Save me.